then I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Paul O'Shea. He's the founder, uh, he's a founder and CSO of Exemplify Biopharma. Has more than 25 years of multidisciplinary experience in research and development in the pharmaceutical industry. And he earned both his bachelor's and PhD in chemistry from University College Galway, Ireland. He still has the accent, <laughs> clearly. He has co authored 43 peer reviewed publications and 19 patents. He has experience working with CROs as well as CMOs based in the US, Europe, and Asia and API technology transfer from lab to pilot to manufacturing scale. And he's here today to talk about the role of CMC in IND enabling studies. And so with that, welcome, Paul. I'm looking forward to your presentation as are we all. Take away. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me just uh, share my screen. We're all good. Okay, so thanks everybody for joining me this morning. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, where does CMC fit into IND enabling studies, I guess. Anybody who's working in discovery whose project is successful enough to go into IND enabling studies, it's a pretty exciting time. So there's a lot of things that, that occur in this sort of piece of the pipeline, if I, if I put it that way. So I'd like to talk a little bit about where CMC fits into this, uh, this part of the pipeline. So just in a general sense uh, for what I'm going to talk about this morning, just a little bit about what exactly is CMC. It's an acronym that you hear bandied around a lot. And I'm not sure that everybody uh, completely understands the history of where CMC came from or what exactly it, it means in terms of uh, uh, projects going forward. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about where CMC fits into IND enabling studies and all of the workup, let's say, towards getting your, your molecule into the clinic. There are two sort of sets of um, deliverables from CMC. There's all the technical aspect, the scientific aspect. But CMC is also a regulatory term and it has some implication. It means it means something in terms of, let's say, your IND filing. Then I'd also like to talk a little bit about the transition of, of molecules and programs from discovery to development. Uh, not always the most straightforward transition, to be, to be honest. And finally, if I have time at the end, I'll just tell you a little bit about my company, uh, Exemplify Biopharma. So what is CMC in, in terms of of how it's described in terms of functional areas. There are five functional areas involved in CMC, and they are process chemistry, uh, analytical chemistry, which serves both uh, anal analysis and methods for the drug substance and the drug product. Then there's formulation development, uh, quality assurance, and uh, regulatory affairs. So the quality insurance is obviously uh, related to, to vendors and vendor selection and uh, all, all the quality assurance aspects of a program. And the regulatory affairs part is obviously important because as I say, CMC itself is a, is a term that's taken from, uh, from a regulatory filing. So what does the FDA, I'll use the FDA as an example. It's, it's no different than EMA or other regulatory organizations. What are their expectations for CMC? So essentially the, the CMC comes from that, the, the acronym comes from the title Chemistry, uh, Manufacturing and Controls. But what does this really involve? So it's it's one full module of an IND submission. It's module three. And it encompasses uh, essentially, in a nutshell, it's about tell me everything about the molecule in terms of its composition, who makes it, is it stable, how do you control it, how do you manufacture it, whether it's the drug substance or the drug product. So all that information is expected to be part of your IND submission and falls again under this general heading of uh, CMC. And why did the agency want this information? Essentially, they want to show that you know what you're doing, not to put it too bluntly, but to show that you understand that you can make materials, that you can uh, analyze materials, that you know what you're making, and that the supply is somewhat, is, is essentially consistent meeting whatever specifications you have and is suitable, obviously, from a safety perspective to be to be administered to patients or, or healthy volunteers or whatever your clinical study uh, encompasses. So what are the technical deliveries, uh, deliverables associated with CMC? So in a lot of companies, uh, formulation early formulation work is done by DMPK groups or, or groups that are non-CMC. But in the last few years, I think a lot of a lot of organizations have switched to making this a sort of a CMC type function. 
So it's a very, it's obviously quite important or very important to have a suitable formulation to support all of your toxicity program, your preclinical toxicity program, and any pharmacology work that you need to do. And while that this sounds straightforward, I'll, I'll talk a little later. It can be quite a quite a challenge to come up with the right the right formulations to do that kind of work. The other aspect is is obviously making drug supply. So uh, you'll hear me say a few times during this presentation: no no drug supply. Essentially, your program is at a standstill. All the activities that need to get done uh, requ require obviously supply of, a of API. So you need a scalable, somewhat scalable. I would say scalable in the context of appropriate to, to whatever uh, studies they're doing or whatever scale you need. Uh, you also need an appropriate phase. So your final form of your API, should it be the free form, a salt, a polymorph, a co-crystal? Uh, what, what is the most, uh, the best form for your API in terms of, of development? Um, you obviously need a scalable drug product or, or formulation manufacturing process. Um, especially if you're going to go into the clinic with um, a tablet or a capsule or something like that, uh, because you obviously have to be able to make uh, your phase one clinical supplies. And for, for all of these activities, you need the appropriate analytical method. So you need to be able to determine the purity of your drug substance or drug product. You need to be able to measure all the appropriate parameters that the agencies would expect to see uh, in, ter in terms of your control. And finally, uh, you need stability data. So you can't file your IND without uh, any without stability data for both the drug substance and the drug product. Essentially, you need to show that that um, in the course of your studies, the the drug substance or product don't don't decompose or don't degrade. And finally, you need uh, to characterize the molecule. So. You know, again, as part of your filing, you need to have information about structure, solubility, uh, PKA, log P, and so forth. All, all that information is required. In terms of what the agency expects to see, obviously, they expect to see Module 3, uh, you know, filled with all your CMC information. They, they want to see, as I mentioned, all the molecular properties. So you need to have the structure, uh, you know, whether that's NMR data, whether that's single crystal data. Um, Physical characterization, you know, things like even melting point or, or how does the solid behave, what, what's the solubility, uh, PKA, and all of those types of things. You need to provide for, for your API manufacturing and method, analytical methods, you need to provide a process description. Uh, you need to describe the release methods that you're using. You need to set specifications. And typically, you'll be asked to provide historical uh, batch release data. So. What, what's the quality of the material, for example, that went into your toxicology study? Uh, um, what's the quality of the material that's going to go into your clinical study? On the formulation side, it's, it's similar. You know, you need your, your process description, um, your methods, and your specifications. In the case of, of uh, formulation, if you're running a placebo uh, control study, then you also need to include uh, information about the placebo. Um, you need to provide information about how you're packaging the material. So, you know, is your is your API in a glass bottle? Is it in a plastic bag? Uh, for example, uh, your formulation is it is it capsules in a in a in a container? Is it a blister pack or whatever? So you have to provide all that information. And finally, you have to provide the stability information uh, to show that at least for the duration of the, of your early studies, you have enough stability to support those studies. So I want to switch a little bit. So in, in terms of where CMC fits in, it's it's kind of interesting in terms of project management because CMC kind of falls into the into the middle of a project as it's transitioning from, from discovery into development. And things in discovery are, I would say, quite different than they are in development. And sometimes that can be a very smooth transition and sometimes that can be quite a bumpy, let's say, transition. So... Not, not to uh, insult anybody who's working in discovery, but I've tried to define what discovery really means in terms of, of a very high level. So, uh, you know, it's, it's essentially an iterative uh, process to refine the structure and, you know, to obtain the molecules with the best overall balance of properties for whatever your program is. So, you know, if your program requires high solubility, then you need to factor that in. If your program requires certain structural features, you obviously have to put that in whatever the pharmacology aspects or the uh, pharmacokinetics are. So essentially it's, it's making a lot of molecules obviously, and then 
trying to learn from each iteration as to how to improve whatever those specific and necessary properties are. In preclinical development, I guess the way I would describe it is it's it's everything that you need to do to, uh, I guess, um, convince yourself or assure yourself that you're selecting a good candidate. So everything you need to do to to prove to yourself and, and obviously the, the, the regulatory agencies that you can make a molecule, you can formulate it, that you understand the, pharm- the pharmacology, the pharmacokinetics, toxicology, and, and a whole plethora of other things that you need to you know, have some fundamental understanding of in, in, in terms of helping you to nominate a candidate that you can put into essentially preclin- you know, a single candidate that can go into preclinical development where you can learn a lot more about that individual molecule. And then in terms of clinical development, which is obviously later stage, the, the CMC especially and the clinical program are very focused. You, you have one molecule you're trying to understand in, at a very high or a very low, high, whichever way I describe it, level, the, the properties of that molecule, how to make that molecule the, the most uh, you know, economically viable, safest, and so forth. Uh, but everything is, is, is focused on one single molecule. So in the preclinical world, a lot of effort obviously goes into selection of the molecule because there you can, you can, you can change, you can pick a different analog. Once a molecule goes into, into clinical development, you are essentially stuck, if you want to put it that way, with the properties of that molecule. So if that molecule is, has insolubility, then you have to figure ways to improve that. And those challenges all become sort of CMC challenges later. So I think a lot of effort is obviously done in the preclinical space to try to se- select the best molecule with the best balance of overall properties. So the other aspect is is about the developability of a molecule. So, you know, again, you're down to a specific candidate or a specific molecule. And how do you what do you want to assess the intrinsic properties of that molecule? It's obviously a very important component for preclinical development because you're going to focus your efforts on that single molecule. And it's it's not a it's not a unilateral or a it, it, it's a very much a team based decision and it's it's about input from a number of different functions about this particular molecule in terms of you know historical data uh, and how that molecule behaves what the clinical expectations are so a number of groups obviously have very large input into the selection of a molecule, including, you know, the medicinal chemistry groups, pharmacology, toxicology, DMPK, for example. And historically, CMC was nowhere on this list. I, in my career, 10, 15 years ago, CMC was only brought into a program after all of this was done. But in the last few years, that's changed because it, it's become clear that the, the, the CMC aspect of development becomes is really important and, and needs to have an input in terms of helping to select the right molecule. Because to be honest with you, a molecule that has, you know, the best potency and selectivity and hits all the right, you know, uh, biomarkers is fantastic. But if it has a solubility of brick dust, you, you, you can't develop it anyway. So, so in recent times, CMC has been sort of invited to the table, let's say, to help with the, the selection of, of molecules. So how do you assess the properties of, of a molecule? I mean, this is obviously uh, pretty complex, in, in, and I'm being a little simplistic here, but, you know, in terms of medicinal chemistry, you're looking for your potency, your selectivity, you know, what's your off-target profile. You, you may be making molecules specifically for, for IP, uh, you know, obviously to generate, but also to, to uh, protect your own IP. Um, on the on the DMPK side, you're interested in obviously the ADME properties, uh, projecting human dose. Uh, what's your PK PD rationale? How do you how do you justify that? In terms of toxicology, you're obviously interested in how you well you obviously need let's say a, a a safe molecule to go into into clinical studies. So you're going to be doing your dose range finding studies, your GLP toxicity study, whole plethora of safety pharmacology, genotoxicity. And trying to establish, you know, what are your clinical safety margins so that you can understand what your limitations are on dosing in the clinic. And then from a CMC side, again, you're, you, the CMC folks are, are concerned about the chemistry because the first task that the CMC folks are going to have is to scale up chemistry and make materials. Can this molecule be formulated? What are the, the, the liabilities or the limitations? 
very good understanding of the physiochemical properties because that will really influence your formulation strategy. So things like solubility, uh, pKa, all of those measurements are very important to, to help with understanding uh, how to formulate this molecule correctly. And obviously the, the molecule stability is, is also very important. So the, there is, there is uh, a transition is the way I would describe it between, in, in a project like any project where you've, you've selected a molecule and you, um, you want to, sorry, let me put this up. You want to um, bring it into, into development essentially. So your ultimate goal is to select the molecule, uh, do all of your preclinical pre IND workup established, you know, that the molecule is safe and, and does what you expect it to do and bring it into the clinic. So during that transition, there's obviously a lot of different groups with a lot of, uh, let's say, not vested interests, but uh, inter all have an interest in moving the program forward, but from a different perspective. So what I try to capture here is just a very kind of simplistic, maybe overview of, of differences in perception or thought process based on experience between folks who, who are discovery focused and folks who are development focused because there's quite a difference. So just a few simple things. So let's say the time horizon, at least when I work in discovery, everything is like on a daily basis. And if something takes more than a week, people are very impatient. Um, and typically things can be done in that time frame. If you move into development, the, there's no such things in days and weeks. Everything takes months and quarters and sometimes, you know, half a year. So you're your, your first chemical synthesis, let's say, of, of five grams might take you a week. Your first chemical synthesis of five kilos might take you six months. So it's, it's, there's a quite a difference in perception on, on how fast things can move and should move. In terms of planning, which, which I'll talk about a little later, but planning is, is a very crucial part of all the CMC activities. In, in the discovery world, it's, it's, it's really data-driven. So, you know, you get the data and then you make your next decision. Uh, and it's often single function driven. So, you know, medicinal chemists get some data for, let's say, uh, herb binding assay that's good, then those structures look more promising. If it's bad, then the decision is to maybe make different structures to try to dial that out of the molecule. And it's, it's very much uh, driven by each function. In CMC, on, it's quite different. Everything is, everything is interrelated. Um, and so it's, it's very much driven at a, at a kind of project level. So the formulator needs to know what kind of API the, the chemist is making and so forth. So, so it's, it, it's dri the projects are driven quite differently. In terms of cost, I mean, the relative, this relative cost. So this, again, this is a relative term. I'm not saying discovery is cheap. I'm just saying that relative to development, it's quite low. In development, it's it's expensive. Everything is you know is uh, very expensive, and it's a very big financial commitment. So, so the expectations are obviously different than than um, than they would be in, on the discovery side. In terms of regulations, again, you know there, there's, uh, and I mean this in terms of FDA, not 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 safety or environmental regulations, but th it's minimum in terms of activities that occur in discovery. But what you have to remember is as soon as you classify a molecule as de going into development or in development, it's, it's a fully regulated environment. So you have to operate under guidances from either FDA or ICH. And a lot of the activities are, are under GMP, which does affect things like the timeline and the cost. Uh, in terms of documentation, obviously, you know, for, for, from a discovery point, point of view, it's, re it's study reports and, and these may be filed or, or not filed as part of your filing. For, for CMC, all the documentation is eventually going to end up in an IND filing. So, so again, it's, it's prescribed, you know, what needs to be done. In terms of technical quality, and I, I use this term loosely from a chemistry point of view, the, the, the chemist will say, okay, the NMR looks good, so the compound's fine. On the CMC side, all your analytical methods need to be validated. You need to identify impurities. You need to quantitate impurities. So it's, it's a lot more elaborate, let's say, and requires a lot more work. From a discovery point of view, your, under, your understanding of development is actually very important because, because you can, ha I, yeah, I think anybody who works in CMC would agree, you can have very unrealistic expectations of what can be done, how long it takes, and how much, how much it's going to cost. 
So the, the more informed, let's say, a discovery uh, chemist or pharmacologist or, or, or uh, any other function has, the, the better it will be for them and, and also obviously for the project. On the flip side, from a CMC perspective, the understanding of the activity and discovery is not so important. You're going to focus on a single molecule and you're, you're actually, in a sense, you're, you're going forward. So the historical data, while important, is, is usually not that much. It's usually uh, very little data. So you're building the data set as you go forward. So you're on, your need for a very in-depth understanding of activities and discovery is actually not that important. So in terms of, of what, what, what does this look like in a, in a sort of project sense, um, you have your candidate selection activities, which, which are pretty much all rooted in discovery. Uh, you have your IND enabling studies, which is where that overlap occurs between discovery and development. So it's not, it's not quite yet what, what you would term a development project because you haven't uh, gotten through your, your IND enabling studies but it has a big development uh, uh, contribution, let's say. So that's that kind of um, mixed area, if you want to call it. And then typically after your IND, the project is, is pretty much labeled as development and it becomes a clinical program, essentially. And then all of the development uh, activities are, are pretty clear, uh, everything that needs to get done. So it's in this, this zone, let's say, where there's a lot of overlap uh, and, and it's a very busy part time for the project because everything is new and everything is in obviously in a hurry. Um, so in this candidate selection, uh, let's say time frame, typically, and again, there are obviously exceptions and, and many different things can happen, but typically there's a, you know, one to three. out there that that the teams uh, which is again can be different numbers than this which is typical a couple of hundred grams to, to support that you often want to select a form that time so you maybe need a few grams for that and you'll have to develop some time Uh, some sort of relationship is reached, then the kind of development aspect has to kick in because, in a sense, now you're looking to make more than likely kilos of material. So you need to, you know, have this route that can do that, be making them. Stay. Uh, you will definitely need to identify a developable phase because you want to use that for your GLP toxic toxicology study. You'll start working on a clinical formulation, start to make clinical supplies, and then, you know, as, again, establish the, the stability and write module three. So all these activities are, are totally interrelated. Um, and, and to be honest, all depend on that first, first line. You have to make material, no material, uh, you can't go forward. And, and typically, again, typically this is a 12 to 18 month timeline. So depending on when you, each company does it slightly differently, depending on when you, you, you uh, acknowledge day one or what, what your starting point is, it's typically a year to a year and a half to complete all these activities. So what can influence that timeline? What can make that longer or shorter or more or less complicated? Uh, obviously, the package, the technical package that comes from the discovery folks, what's the synthetic route look like? Um, the amount of what I call juggling. So having one or two candidates in play is a little easier to manage than having eight or ten candidates in play and trying to figure out which one you want to go forward with. It can cause a lot of, of complexity. Uh, the criteria for your candidate selection. So like I alluded to, when does the clock start? So in some organizations, candidate selection comes as I outlined on the previous slide, after dose range finding. In other companies, candidate selection only comes after the GLP toxicology study. So that, that sort of stocks, starts your clock in terms of when you want to measure time. 
And that does vary from company to company. There's no standard answer or no standard way to do that. It also depends on your risk posture. You know, uh, you'll hear the term phase appropriate a lot. So it, it comes down to your organizational decision on what you consider to be phase appropriate. Um, and, and that can have an uh, implication for cost. It can have imp implication for time. Uh, and it can also, uh, I would say, generate what we term the hurry up and wait syndrome. Hurry up and wait syndrome, where you you get certain activities done, and because you decided to postpone activities, you end up with a delay later. Um, it also depends on your degree of pre-investment. So, how much work do you want to do at risk? You know, how how prepared do you want to be for success, essentially, and how much do you want to invest in that? And Obviously, running activities sequentially or in parallel is, is related to this, but uh, some companies select to just wait for each data point and then run the next the next uh, piece of piece of work. Others kind of bundle it all up together and run many things in parallel. And obviously, the technical complexity can have a big impact. So, you know, two step synthesis where where you know yields are ninety five percent and purity is great is. It's quite a different scenario than a 25 step synthesis with you know 25 chromatographies and overall yield of 0.1 percent, for example, or your difficulty in fi finding a, the right phase. So maybe you've worked with amorphous material for the program thus far. It has some stability issues. You need to find a crystalline form or a salt form uh, to to bring your program forward. So those technical complexities are not so easy to plan for. But can you know generally get folded in as part of your overall risk posture and, and how much do you want to pre-invest in some of these activities? So this slide, I'm not expecting anybody to 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 even attempt to read it. All I wanted to show here was that this is a typical timeline chart that we would use for for program management, just to give you an idea of how many activities you will kickstart all in the same time frame. To bring your, your to get your program to to be to a point where you can file an IND, so you have all the chemistry activities, the stability activities, the formulation activities, salt selection, a whole plethora of things all happening in the same time frame, which which can actually in itself be be quite a limitation because most most of the organizations that we work with, let's say, are, are virtual, so you don't have any internal lab labs lab capability. Um, so all of these activities are generally outsourced. So, you, you know, a lot of calls, a lot of different vendors, because it's, it's difficult to find vendors, single vendors that do everything you need. So the logistic, the logistical part of the, of the project is actually quite high. So as I mentioned, yeah, there's the many interdependent logistics and, and the CMC activities require a lot of planning, coordination, and, and they do require active management. It's, you, you, you can't just sort of send out the, 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 the work and, and expect the answer to come back without any active management. Um, with all of this, what are the most likely things to cause delays that could be related to CMC? So obvious one is interruption of the drug substance supply. So you have issues with scale up, maybe the chemistry doesn't work as well as you expected, or the medicinal chemistry route is just not suitable for scale up and needs to be redesigned. So you have to do a lot of process development up front. Uh, another one is amorphous versus crystalline. A lot, a lot of work that's done in discoveries with amorphous material, and then suddenly the batch crystallizes. Um, another big stumbling block that we see is that the formulation for toxic toxicity studies requires a lot more work than you might expect. Mm -hmm. Typically, uh, you know, for compounds that have low solubility that you just can't get the desired exposure or you can't get dose proportionality to the levels that you expect uh, or, would, or need for your toxicology studies. Again, this is related to the classification, whether it's a you know, low solubility, high permeability, or low solubility, low permeability molecule. They all have unique challenges that need to be solved. Uh, stability issues, again, when materials are amorphous, for example, they can often have significant stability issues. And... Despite all your work, sometimes this happens. A new purity or, or a new polymorph shows up unexpectedly and kind of throws a spanner into the into the works, or a new impurity shows up when you scale up chemistry that you have difficulty to remove. And then one thing that I, I it sounds uh, trivial, but the logistics of engaging a CRO can be mind-boggling at times, especially if you're a small virtual company. You know the time it takes to get a 
CDA in place, to get an MSA in place or to get a quality agreement in place, you know, you would think should only take days or, you know, a week at most. But sometimes I've seen these take up to half a year to get some of these documentation and, and the business aspect of agreements in place uh, to enable you to even start doing some work. So I guess the, the final, the kind of final message is that all of the CMC activities are are on the critical path um, at the, at this point in in development or or at least in the IND enabling part. So the simple kind of message is that if you have don't have a suitable synthesis, you can't make any drug, uh, and if you have no drug, then you you can't go forward in preclinical development. If you don't have an acceptable form, you also have no drug because you don't know what to what to make. So whether your final form be a salt, whether it be amorphous, whether it be a specific polymorph, you need to decide that as well, or else you just can't make it. So, and again, if you don't have the proper toxicology formulation, then you can't do your DRF or your GLP studies and so on and so forth. I think that the, the, the major message here is that the, the synthesis of the drug and the drug properties uh, are, are going to be on the critical path until you get into the clinic. After that, it's, it's a different set of issues, and typically it's about resupply because you've bought yourself some time and, and you can figure out how to solve some problems. Um, when do people engage CMC? So typically, as I said, in the past, it was typically after candidate selection or, or, or even after all of the pre-IND uh, enabling work was done. But these days, uh, I guess, in our experience, companies fall into two categories, th those that engage after candidate selection, and I guess those who engage only when they figure out they have a problem or an issue uh, and, and are essentially looking for immediate, let's say, immediate help. In, in, in our opinion, the optimal time to engage CMC is, is during your candidate selection process because there are a lot of things that can be done in advance to, to help with the timeline. A, lo a lot of strategic decisions can be taken about where to make materials, where to get materials, whether to pre-invest in materials. Um, but so, so that would be the, opti the optimal time. Um, so that, that's, that's everything I had to discuss uh, for, for the CMC aspect. If I have a minute, I can just give you a little bit of an overview of our company. So we're Exemplified Biopharma. We're located in Cranberry in New Jersey, we, and we're founded in 2015. We, we offer CMC consulting, and uh, we also have a CMC laboratory uh, that, that serves process chemistry, analytical, and formulation development, or early formulation development. And we, we strive to give end-to-end -end CMC deliverables essentially under, under one, one roof. Um, we do like to think that we can add value in terms of uh, a partnership with, with different organizations. So, you know, for... for we would hope that if you if you if you spend a dollar with us, we can give you back maybe a dollar five worth of value, or maybe a dollar ten. Um, uh, as we are a very science focused organization and have a lot of experience uh, in in both consulting and obviously in lab. And in terms of IND enabling, the services that we offer are essentially uh, uh, consulting services. So anything from high level strategy down to sending an auditor uh, to visit one of your CROs and do an audit. Uh, we also author all the IND Chapter 3 or Module 3. We can help with selecting CROs and their oversight and, and provide any sort of technical or, uh, tactical or technical support. On the lab side, we would do all the normal activities you expect to see. So we have a process development group. We can do an analytical method and validation. We do a lot of work to support toxicology formulation development and then obviously pre-formulation and all of the um, associated work with that and stability work. And with that, I will say thank you very much for, for joining uh, today, and uh, I'll certainly answer any questions that you might have. Wonderful. Thank you again for your presentation, Dr. Paul. There's one question from the audience from Ms. Kathleen Mulner, um, and she's asking, what in-house CMC activities can be worth investing in from a small or mid-size uh, perspective? Sorry, could you can you can you repeat that question? Sorry, I missed that. Kathleen is asking, what in-house CMC activities can be worth investing in from a small or mid-sized company's perspective? I think the main the main uh, activities to, that are worth pre-investing in are related to the drug substance. So you know, 
depending on the medicinal chemistry route and depending on the complexity of the, the sinuses, I mean, that's, that's always going to be your biggest um, uh, roadblock, essentially, to, to making progress. So a, a lot of folk, a lot of companies pre-invest in just, let's say, verifying that the medicinal chemistry route is scalable. Um, also, if there are multiple candidates in play that have a common scaffold, for example, they may pre-invest in, in having that scaffold synthesized to get, to get sort of a, a, head, a head start rather than waiting for the actual candidate to be selected and then deciding to go forward. So I would say most of it's around chemistry um, in terms of the value you would get from chemistry versus some of the other functions, because the other functions like formulation can, can, be, can usually be managed later once you have material. Any other questions? Are those all the questions from the chat box? I believe so far that is. And uh, again, Dr. Paul is a very solid scientist. Um, his team um, is taking part in sponsoring our program. And if you are interested in connecting further with him, his colleague, um, uh, John Balesta, and others, you can request a meeting with them via our scheduler link. And um, yeah, if you have any remarks uh, for him, uh, uh, Karen. Uh, yeah, I do. I have, uh, uh, I think, a, a comment and, and a couple of questions. Uh, but first off, uh, great presentation, Paul. Thoroughly enjoyed it. CMC is very important in, in getting into clinic. And uh, I, I, I feel the pain uh, of uh, folks that actually have to do this after the candidate selection and, you know, <laughs> try, try and make something work after, after something's already been chosen. Um, I also like the comment on brick dust, and that's just from, again, a personal perspective of, you know, using things that are brick dust and having a chemist tell me that it should be soluble. <laughs> so uh, my questions, um, you know, with regards to, to getting to final form, um, how what has been your biggest challenge, I guess, and how long has it actually taken uh, for, the, for that to get to a final form? I, I think the biggest challenge is... is I would say lack of predictability. So you, you actually don't know what the answer is going to be. So for example, you know, if, you, if your molecule has a suitable pKa to make a salt, I don't think anybody can tell me that the citrate salt will be the one, if you know what I mean, that that, that, that will be the one that will give you the best, you know, let's say solubility or stability, whatever term, you know, whatever you're trying to solve for. So it involves a lot of screening um, and in, and then it's hard to predict timing. So if the first screen works and you get great hits, then great. It might only take you a couple of weeks. If the first screen gives nothing and you're, you know, you're down to screen five or six or seven, you could be half a year at this and you may have to make some decisions about whether it's actually viable or not. So I think that's the biggest challenge is no predictability. Um, and also um, the, the after all of that, you may have, half a dozen salts, none of which actually solve your problem. I think that's the biggest challenge. Okay. Uh, the, the next question I have is, uh, how often, if ever, have you run into issues with the submission to the FDA? Oh, that's a good question. Um, for, for an IND filing from a CMC perspective, I've actually never run into an issue. Uh, the package that's expected is is. I mean, it's very well laid out what the agency expects to see. Um, and I, th I think that, you know, the, the, the level of detail that they require is, is not very large, you know, where you, where you have to have a very, very comprehensive understanding. I think the, the agency is quite, uh, not forgiving, but the, the agency is quite amenable to, as long as you show you have an understanding, as long as you can show the quality of the materials, and as long as you can demonstrate that, through production and, and everything else, there's no no uh, impact on patient safety. I think at, at IND filing, the, the agency is very reasonable, let's say. So I've never seen a, a program, at least in small molecule, I, you know, maybe in other, other modalities it's different, but in small molecule, I've never seen a program be put on clinical hold for, let's say, phase one because of a CMC issue. I've seen lots of questions, obviously, but, but not, not to the point where you know, they will put you on clinical hold. 
Okay, so my last question, just following on from, from what uh, your, your comment there, uh, do you actually support uh, biologic CMC as well, or is that purely small molecule? Right now, right now we're a small molecule shop, but uh, we're, we're expanding. We will be supporting biologics in the future. That's good to know, at least from yeah. where yeah. right now. We have Thank to go with times, you know. Uh, that's where that's where a lot of the work is now, and a lot of the exciting science. So, so yeah, we, we are planning to move into biologics. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you again. And there is just one much. more one more question from uh, Mr. Derek Bone. He's asking for managing expectations. Are there reasonable rules of thumb for timelines and broad budgets to complete an end-to-end -end CMC process? I think the answer is is yes. I mean. Um, you know, based on certainly our experience, uh, our team's experience, that there are certain sort of expected time frame for activities to take place. So, for example, if I were planning a new project and we were talking about, you know, salt screening, I would say you should plan, let's say, two months. There are many vendors, uh, and I would say maybe you should plan, for argument's sake, if it's an if it's a typical, and I use the word loosely because no no real project is typical, but you know, plan to have. Eighty thousand dollars for that particular activity. Um, so there are there are sort of standards. You know, if your chemistry is X number of steps, you have and you don't have any really fancy reagents, you can kind of figure out how much it's going to cost in advance. Uh, so you can plan both timing and budget. Um, the 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 challenge can often be things that you don't anticipate. So you know, uh, I hate to say this, but you know, shipping strike somewhere um you know obviously covid is a, is a big one to mention but a lot smaller than that Th things can derail th things you know you lose a slot at a cro because you were you know you were a week or two late in in getting a contract signed things like that but in general you can plan pretty well actually and pretty accurately um for for the cmc aspect um and and yeah, I, I would say that's pretty straightforward. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I again appreciate um, your presentation, Dr. Paul. And um, I guess now we can uh, move on to the next session, which is uh, from Merck, Garija, Dr. Garija Raman. Uh, so, Karen, I guess we can head over to that room as well now. Thank you very much.